Thank you. I was told to stand in the magic circle. I feel like I should make a Skylanders joke or something right now. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me to DICE. Um, I was able to speak here three years ago after Fallout 3, and because of Skyrim, this is actually my first DICE since then, and I always enjoy the keynote, so we'll see how this one goes since I'm giving it. Um, if this goes really, really well, um, that's great. If it goes poorly, it's Ted Price's fault because he uh, talked me into this. He's, he has a way with words, excellent penmanship. He's much taller and more handsome than I am. Um, and he said I would do great. Uh, so if it's terrible, thank you, Ted. Um, I uh, have been with Bethesda for, this is my 18th year. Um, and that's, so I got in the industry in 94. And uh, when I started at Bethesda, this game had just come out, Terminator Rampage. Um, we were, E3 didn't exist yet. So we had CES and we were in a tent. The video games were in like a big tent with the porn. Uh, this was my first experience in the industry. I have made a terrible mistake. Oh, there's Blizzard's booth. They're closer to the porn than we are. It's probably all fine. Um, and uh, this game had come out and my, at this time we had made the games, we literally would box the games in the basement of the building and Radio Shack returned like all 6,000 copies they bought of Terminator Rampage because they were, they did a spot check and they were different numbered discs, they weren't the right discs, came out like eight floppy discs. We had to open every copy of Terminator Rampage and make sure it had the right discs and repackage them up. You know, you look how far we've come. I know you all remember this game because because this game came out right around the same time. And so, <laughs> nobody remembers Terminator. And this was the first game I did at Bethesda. First full 3D, you know, uh, mouse look. And then this thing came out and like nobody. <laughs> and I've made a lot of games since then. And if you don't know, we then bought id recently, like a few years ago, so. Um, and and uh, <laughs> it's like, just stop messing with us. We'll just get together. Um, <laughs> You know, Carmack had a few requests. One, he could still have lunch with his rocket and get paid in golf checks, and we worked that out. And so now we are studios together. Uh, so those of you, I get asked this question a lot. So uh, Bethesda Softworks, Bethesda Game Studios, there are a number of studios that are published by Bethesda Softworks. id Software, you know. Uh, ZeniMax Online is our online studio that started many years ago, working on a project that hasn't been announced yet. Um, Arcane Studios who you know from um, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Uh, they're currently working on Dishonored that's been announced. Um, Tango Studios in Japan, uh, Shinji Mikami Studio, uh, is most well known for Resident Evil. And uh, Machine Games, uh, which is a studio that was started by a lot of the principals from Starbreeze Studios. So they're all part of uh, ZeniMax, and we are published by Bethesda Softworks. So I work for Bethesda Game Studios, the internal dev studio, and we're published by this, and Bethe we're also part of ZeniMax Media. Bethesda Softworks is part of ZeniMax Media, which also has divisions in <laughs> Europe and Asia and then these. What's weird is ZeniMax is actually a Delaware corporation, this, which is the same as Activision as EA, which asks the question, what is up with Delaware? Who runs Delaware? Joe Biden, who is almost like the ruler of the universe. So. Uh, this is what the talk is actually about. Um, why, why do we, I was told to give it a title, so I wanted something fairly generic that I could do anything with, but the, the gist of this and what's, what's on my mind a lot is what is special about games? Why do we create them? Well, why do we play them? Why do our players uh, enjoy them so much? What is special about them? What is special about creating games? Um, is this a game? Like our parents see when we were growing up, well, that's, you know, is it a game, a toy? Is it a game like chess? Is it some weird combination of light, bright, and chess? They see a game and it's no different than a toy often. You look at, say, Robotron. You know, this is interactive light, bright. So is it a toy? Is it a game? Is, is it entertainment? A lot of people say, how should I look at gaming? 
Is it like a movie? Is it like this? Um, and I see games as a creator as the ultimate combination of art and technology. You could say this about movies as well, like a lot of movies use a lot of high-end 3D or things like that, but there's something special, I think, about, okay, you know, you know, don't take all night to render a frame. Do it 30 frames a second on a consumer device and make it fun. What is, what is fun? Um, and even the type of technology, software development, is a very different kind of development. Uh, John Carmack told me a great anecdote. You know, he builds rockets, as you know, and uh, <clears throat> he's a rocket scientist. I said, John, you know, rockets, this, uh, that must be really hard. He said, programming a rocket is way easier than a game. You know, it goes too far left, thrust right. It, you know, it's not a problem. The, diff the game crashes, and I just reset the Xbox. The difference with rockets is the rocket crashes, and there's a mess spread out over several miles. And, you know, that makes developing rockets a lot harder. Um, it's these two disciplines coming together. And this is an image we use in the team, so it's not just the two disciplines coming together, it's the people you have on your team working together. Um, I showed this slide last time I talked to DICE, and there'll be some things that I, I will show again because we haven't changed how we do some things. Our way of looking at games is still pretty much the same as it was three years ago. We like this so much that we did our own image uh, that does say nice in dragon language. Um, you know, okay, we are werewolves and dragons high-fiving. That's how we should work together. Um, and, and this is one of our big rules, which is the plan that you have is not important as your culture. So you see a lot of game uh, you know, makers will say, well, here's the big schedule, here's everything we're going to do. You know, if, if they're really trying, they're going to run into problems. And those problems are solved by the culture you have on your team. Um, the same goes for your design, okay? Your ideas are not as important as your execution, okay? So you have the best design, but when you play it, you know, how well can you pull off that idea? That's, that really is what's key. Um, we have three big rules of game development uh, on our team at Bethesda Game Studios that we use when we create them. Uh, I'm going to back my way through them. Number three is define the experience. Don't define your game by, you know, a list of features. Define it by the experience you want the player to have. And in the kind of games that we create, that experience is be who you want and go do what you want. You know, this is a, this is a better design for Skyrim than some giant list of features of all things you can do. This gives you a feeling and it conjures up things in your own mind of who you would be and what you would do and where you would go and you know, the game rewards exploration. Uh, looking at how, this is a review from, of Skyrim, how people see your game. You know, what are the things they pick out and say, well, that's what's important. What's very interesting about this review is I actually changed a word of it. I changed the words arena to Skyrim. It appeared in PC Gamer number one, uh, what is it, 18 years ago. So that, that review is about the first Elder Scrolls. Okay, so the experience of that franchise is still the same through all of the games. Uh, and you take a look at Arena and how we sort of look at the franchise over time and how we want to develop it. You know, our team has worked on it for a very long time. Arena sort of takes place in this giant world. It's just a big open thing. It takes, you know, every province of Tamriel, our fantasy world. Daggerfall in 96 focuses more on the character, your player character. Morrowind in 2002 starts, we get more into uh, hand building the world. How can it be more real? Oblivion in 2006 we start looking at the AI of the characters around you and what can we do. And it's easy to look at Skyrim and say, well, it's that with dragons. But that's not what it was. And these slides are actually, these slides date back uh, to, I don't know, 2007 when we first started the project. Is what is the overall for Skyrim is that we are going to tie all these together. That your experience, what you do here is going to affect this and this is going to affect this. and and all these things are going to feel like they're in a more believable world because they can react. We're going to have the story system that looks at what you're doing and gives you new things to do. Dragons are like a, you know, that's, um, that's, a, that's a very specific gameplay feature, not an overall flow of a game. Um, 
This actually was one of the original designs of Skyrim. What is the experience of Skyrim? I bought this Conan action figure like years ago, it was just sitting on my desk. People would say, you know, officer, what are we doing for the next Elder Scrolls? And I would point to the figure. Um, and uh, ironically enough, for the longest time, dual wielding was not in the game. And I would just look at the figure and he'd say, do it. You know you want it in the game. Uh, we start a lot with the world, so we design a lot. How does the world feel to enter it? Um, it has to feel like a place that isn't all cold and snowy. It's a place you want to explore. Um, so these are the initial kinds of designs uh, that we do, as opposed to sitting down and saying, this is how every feature is going to work, and here's our blueprint. This is the game. This is what it feels like. This is what it feels like. We did this very early. This is like a tone setter. What is the tone to us? What is the tone internally when we look at the game? How are we going to speak to everybody outside? How does the game feel? It's a very bold image that we did early on. Um, this, this epic reality of the world of Tamriel, a place that could be built today on Earth, uh, but feels fantastical. And these special ruins, how they tell their stories. Uh, this is Alduin's wall in the game. How many here people have played? Have you played Skyrim? I can use a lot of Skyrim references and assume, all right, good enough. Uh, I'll assume things uh, that might be, you might know or not know. Uh, you know, we would render this in full detail to say like, well, okay, how do they tell their stories over time? Uh, when it came to dragons, we had a very short design. Uh, it's how do dragons feel? They feel like this. Um, and then we had a team that worked on dragons and they just kept iterating and adding things. And, you know, can we have them land? Do we fly? Do they get hurt? How do they roar? How do they talk? Um, you know, this is a better design for how dragons end up in the game than a giant list. Uh, this was a marketing image we did uh, that does bring it all together. This is how the game feels. Uh, second rule of game development we use, keep it simple. This one's, you know, everybody uses this. But do, even doing the, anything you have in your design, to do it well is going to take far longer than you think it will. Uh, one of the things we tell people on the team is we can do anything, we just can't do everything. So we have to pick our battles. And the thing with a role-playing game is that you can have any feature in a role-playing game, right? There's no, like, can I get married? Can I have kids? Can I drive a car? Can I start a football game? Can I take over the world? Maybe, yes, I don't know. There's nothing you would leave off the table in our kind of game. Uh, this is our number one rule, which is great games are played, not made. Uh, you have to play your own game a ton. Uh, we have about 100 people on the team at Bethesda Game Studios. Uh, believe it or not, we did not focus test Skyrim at all. Um, it was just us. We did some internally, but I mean going out and saying, how does it work? Do we think this will fit? Um, we play our own game a ton. Everybody does it every week, starting very early. We have a certain way we give feedback on the team. How do we go through that? Um, the artists in our project, I mean, I would say for the last, I'm going to make up some facts here. Um, for the last six months of the project, they didn't, they all they do is play the game. Unless they got a bug, they're sitting there playing the game and we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. Um, and it's, it's very easy to say to do that, but it's very hard when the feedback is, this doesn't work, right? We must stop. You have to look at the signs or it gets really, really terrible. And you say, well, and then people get upset. Like, and I'll go by, and like, you need to change this. I don't want to do that. And I'm like, you listen to me. You need to change this. Um, and you have to, emotion plays into this. It's all fine. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, you say, this was a mistake. You know, mistakes. <laughs> Correct your mistakes. Um, So this is generally how people put games together, and we do this as well. You spend a lot of time designing, you're like, great, you can all read it. Um, and we want to shift that. We want to shift that balance where we're playing our games sooner. Get to that point faster. Everything after that is opportunity time. That's where the good stuff mostly happens. So you want to maximize your opportunity time to take advantage of things. Um, and this is actually a slide from a team. We would meet every month, the team. This slide is from May 2010, so a long time ago, in the middle of production. And we would remind ourselves, this is what opportunity time is. And then here are examples from May 2010. What are we doing with giants? 
Giants are fun in Skyrim. We weren't using them a lot, so we're ticking them up. We should use them more. Dragons fighting on the ground was a new thing then. They were originally just going to fly around. They're great. We should do that more. Uh, we had a system uh, when, it when you kill guys and it plays back. It's partly borrowed from VATS from Fallout 3. We always is called Cinekill on this date. We kept changing the name every month for fun. My favorite name was Violens. Um, so, you know, it wasn't working well. Are we going to do this? Let's stop working on it for a while. Let's let's work on kill moves some more. People like those in the team better. Um, are we doing favors and friends? I won't go into the, too much detail here on this, but we had a whole system, kind of almost like The Sims, that really showed you, you could give people gifts and do all this stuff and it would track them and there would be a barb of everybody's head and how you stood with everybody and it just became like, what is the point of this? It's all, it's still in the game, it's just behind the scenes and it decides what quests they give you. There's a very large system for that. We actually just say, we need to, we need to step away from this. So question marks for the team at the time are, are we, are we doing this? The skills menu, uh, which I'll show you some, we wanted to tick up on that. Horses were a big question mark. Um, and it's a very good example, we call it putting things in the spotlight. So you can have a feature, take horses, we're going through the project and we don't know, oh look, how much time are they going to take, how polished are they going to be, are they adding to the game, do we like them, should we cut them? Um, and we sort of call it, well let's take it out of the spotlight, you know, let's add to dragons, push the dragons into the spotlight as a feature, let's do more with them, even if we have to cut stuff, because they're great. Let's take the horse, take baby, put her in a corner, put the horse in the corner. So like easy things we could have done that were debates. Can the horse carry your stuff? It's actually very easy for us to make a horse in Skyrim carry your stuff. Well, why didn't we do it? We didn't do it because it would have made them too important. It would have pushed them more toward that spotlight and then all the negatives of horses, the player would have felt more. Well, they act like this on rocks. You can't fight on them. It does this, this, and this. So we kind of take some things. There are things we'll cut but there are also things we'll push out of the spotlight and say, well, let's make that a fun diversion. Player's going to get it. Um, this was a design I did. This was this original skills menu design. So I drew this on a guy's whiteboard. I have a lot of photos I send to people. I'll draw on the whiteboard, take a picture of my iPhone, send it to him, and go, that's what it's like. Uh, and I had wanted to use the constellations from Arena. So like, what's, so how's the skill system in Skyrim? It's like, well, you're going to look to the heavens. What does that mean? Well, we'll have the skill tree, and so we iterated on lots of ways, how are we doing a skills menu looking to the heavens? And at the time, we were using, like, the old Elder Scrolls birth signs, and they were going to have perk trees. Um, and this is just, like, you know, it's really a list of numbers, but how can we make it entertaining or give it other meaning? And we went round and round. It's a very hard thing to crack. This is where we ended up. Um, and what's interesting here is the perk trees are the skills themselves, not the original constellations and the original constellations became the stones you find. So we're kind of drifting our way, like, hey, what feels right to us? Well, here's the original intent. How can we get that on the screen and to the player in the vibe that we want? Um, and just how it moves became a big thing. And this is a good example of, as you're playing your game, you do find the things that the player's gonna do a lot. So anything the player does a lot regardless of what it is. I'm going to go to a menu and check my skills. Well, trick it out, man. Find a way to make that entertaining. Don't just assume that because they're going to do it a lot or it's, it's simple that you, that you shouldn't. So we spent a lot of time doing this and making it parallax and how you fly through the sky. Um, it's probably one of the more successful uh, examples of taking something that's repetitive action and simple and making it something more. Uh, we also look at our game in layers. So when you're looking at any game, and you know, everybody here plays a lot of games, you can almost, you play a game and you say, ah, if they had only, you feel this layer of, I don't know what to call it. At work, I think we have named this the egg of truth, though this is a stupid name, so I don't know what we call it. Um, but you just feel this layer of if they have just done this, there's this other game underneath. Um, the problem is when you're developing a game, that layer of muck is so big, I cannot see through this. Um, how do you look at the game inside of there? And that's the trick when you're doing all of this. Um, something else that I notice happening amongst our group and throughout the industry is dev teams are getting more experienced. So it, the experience level on any dev team is going up in, in comparison to the games that are coming out. So we have found that we can have a lot less structure. We're getting more ninjas on the team, guys or women who can do a lot of stuff. 
and we let them run wild. And we're getting a lot of features and giving them the keys to the creativity and saying, well, make something cool. Here's the vibe. Here's what we want. Um, in general, if you look at uh, the games that are really successful, I think that are coming out well, they're coming from teams that have worked together for a while, I think, that are able to do more of this. Um, one of the ways that we did this is um, when we were doing Skyrim, we do what we call a game jam. Everybody on the team gets to do whatever they want for a week. <laughs> and they can imagine. But you have to put it in Skyrim. OK? Uh, one of the coolest things about being in one of those studios within Bethesda and Zenimax is every year, every December, all the studios get together, and we have a big company-wide meeting, and everybody shows their stuff for the year. So you know, getting to see what id's working on all this stuff early is great. Since we had just finished Skyrim, we sh this year we showed the Game Jam stuff we did. Um, so I'm going to show you the sizzle video from the Game Jam that we did internally, that we showed internally. That's what this video was from. So I need to, everyone on the team says, I have to preface this with, this is all experiments that we did in a week. How much of this stuff sees the light of day to be determined? Could it be in a future DLC? We don't know. Could it be various parts of it just be released for free? We don't know. Uh, but uh, I wanted to show it to you because it gives you a good look at what, what do we do? We let people run wild and just see what they do for a week. And what do I get? An arrow in the knee. Been too long since we've had a good arrow in the knee. You come up to me, fist raised. You're looking for an arrow in the knee. Hold on, Gagan. Yo, Toshu. Isla Nus. Cry now. Toshuta.
so that, am I back on? All right. Nobody heard what I was doing while you're watching that video. No? All right. Uh, so we did the game jam. So that everybody was really, everyone on the team was really excited. Um, and like I said, we all, all the studios get together. John Carmack was like, you want to see what I did last week? He's like, don't, do, stop doing this to me. And uh, this is, this is absolutely real. It's like, I shot a rocket into fucking space. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't say F. I was like, we made a guy ride a dragon down there. Um, shot a rocket into space. The player experience ramp. So um, I'm going gonna, to you know, change uh, the subject a little bit. So this is actually more of the pure design. OK, you're looking for things that are wrong in your game. You're trying to look through. But what is the thing down there? How do people actually? experience your game. You know, what are the stages they go through? The f and, and there's four of these. Um, the first one is they learn your game. And this is the, the, the hardest kind of part where they don't feel completely comfortable. People don't really like learning and getting that part of your game right, making the learning, I, have no, I feel very uncomfortable, I put your game in, I don't know what's going on, making that part entertaining is extremely difficult. Uh, after that, they're just playing. Okay? So they've understood your game, they're just playing around, they don't have fear of dying. Okay? They then get challenged later on, once they've played around for a bit, and now they start feeling this, well, maybe I'll die. And as long as you've got to give them enough tools to win, everybody likes to win. Okay? And then you can surprise them with something new, surprise the player after all you've done all that. And this whole thing repeats itself. So this is actually, an, as opposed to being, it's a loop. So this is an on-ramp to the following loop, OK? Um, I think that, it, you know, I, I've talked about this somewhat before. And I think uh, traditionally, the gaming industry, because developers like to impress other people on their team, they, they tend to focus on the challenge and surprise part. Look what I did. This is really hard. Or, you know, this is, and not as much on the learning and playing. But I think as an industry, it's gotten significantly better. Um, people, I think, that do the loop really well, like good examples of the loop. Valve is really good at the loop. Blizzard, you, you know, think about StarCraft II and that stuff, like really good at that loop, how you're learning and getting new stuff. Um, great example, Half-Life 2, uh, when you get the gravity gun. Okay, get a gravity gun, this is cool. Oh, you literally are playing around with the, with the dog robot. Um, and that's what you want to do. You want to have a good loop here. The one that we still get wrong. You know, why do people put down games? Because the challenge part is off for them, OK? It either isn't enough, so they get bored, or it's way too hard, they get frustrated. That's right. Way too often, it's the frustration one. And that's why people, you know, that's why gaming as an entertainment stops a lot of people. I just got frustrated. I didn't get it. You know, movies don't, rarely you hear a movie, like, did you like Saving Private Ryan? I couldn't get part through the path, part in the rain. It's just too hard. It doesn't have, you know, this is the cinematic <laughs> Private Ryan. Multiplayer games are even worse, OK? I get online with Call of Duty. Here's the cinematic experience of me getting online and what I hear when I play Call of Duty. Do you know how easy this is for me? Do you have any fucking idea how easy this is? This is a fucking joke. And I'm sorry you can't do this. I really am, because I wouldn't have to fucking sit here and watch you fumble around and fuck it up. That one's, that's me. You know, it's very, do I want to keep playing this? That was not, I, my incentive level has dropped dramatically. Um, so getting this, getting that challenge part right, um, I think is the, is the key in doing the whole loop right to people keep playing your game. Uh, the question is, how does story play into this? I mean, th th this loop is a very, it's very, ga it's just gameplay I'm talking about. Uh, you know, how do we look at story? Story gives you context um, and propels you through those loops. How should you feel about what you're doing? Um, here's an example, a uh, gameplay snippet from Dead Island. I think what's interesting about that clip, you know, it's, it's a piece of gameplay. 
But what if you set that against the trailer, the, the fabulous trailer they did, um, the mood and story of that trailer? So I did an experiment. What if, what if you play them simultaneously? How does it change how you're feeling about the action on the left side of the screen? completely different tone to the gameplay, same gameplay that you were seeing. Um, take that a step further with what we do. So you can look at movies or other forms of entertainment, much like uh, Martin was saying. They're generally you know, linear experiences. Most games are as well. Um, what, what do we love about games? What do we try to do the most? Is let the player control the loop. Maybe he's playing around and he wants to learn. Maybe he wants to go here. Maybe he wants to do that. Maybe he wants to go here. So in a game like Skyrim or Fallout 3, whatever we've done, we, we give the player a lot of credit. We trust him. We, we, we give him all these tools and we teach him this stuff. And he's an excellent player director. He wants downtime, he goes to town and talks to people. Says he wants a challenge, I'm gonna go fight that dragon I heard about. Becomes much harder to put the game down. He is the director of his experience. Um, this is a moment when you step out in Skyrim. So you do the whole character generation part, you come out of the early town, and this, you'd be surprised how much time we spent designing this, this step out moment, okay? Generally we feel the player's gonna trust us whichever way he wants to go. Uh, but the key here is the guy who steps out with you, all right? And we actually iterated on the, how he actually said the words, okay? He, we want in that moment, look, you can go do whatever you want. It's all gonna be fine. <laughs> if you're ready for it, just go do what you want. But if you're not, follow this guy. And how he said the words, you should come with, no, you shouldn't come with me. No, maybe you, if you want to, you, like, it was just terrible. And I was working with the designer, like, come on, he needs to break up with you better. Like, it's not you, it's me, we should go, but if you want to come, we'll be friends, it's all right. And we just went through this and through this. And so it's written that he basically says, you go on, I'll go my way, you go your way. But we know a lot of players, they're not ready for the play challenge part. They want to learn. So he takes off, and if you follow him, he goes down and he waits, is he ready yet? And, he, and if you follow him, he then goes, okay, he's with me, and starts doing all this stuff. Um, so we're looking for that initial, how is the player gonna experience this, and designing around it. Um, you take all that a step further, and you talk about story being the context for stuff. What's great about this is people start, it creates their own story. And that's you know, one of the ultimates for us. We ask people their Skyrim experiences, and they're telling us things that we, well, we didn't write that story. We didn't even, you know, what, oh, tell us more. It's really, really interesting to hear everybody's experience. Um, this is Jens Matthias. He is uh, one of the principals at Machine Games, the, the, the ex Starbreeze guys. And for our holiday video that we did for the company, we had a lot of people talk about their experiences playing Skyrim or other games. And Jens had a great Skyrim experience that he recorded, and I asked if I could share uh, that I love. I bought this house in Rifton, beautiful house, I love it, it's just awesome. The first thing I did was just take all of this stuff out of there and I'm just gonna fill, it, fill up the whole thing with skulls. The only problem is that there's some weird stranger living in my house and I can't get rid of her. Uh, she talks all the time, she co she's coughing, I'm trying to, you know, enchant some cool stuff and she's like yawning and sighing and so I take her out into the forest and I tell her, um, okay, I'm sorry, we have to part ways now. And she goes, all right, I'll see you back at the house. I have a bear attack her, she kills the bear. I, I lure her into this um, dungeon of enemies. She survives, she shows up back at the house. Then I try to drown her. But finally, I take her to a giant and I have her attack the giant and the giant clubs her. She flies, you know, into the sky she still survives shows up back at the house i really want to get rid of her <laughs> that's what i was like well that's that's great 
Um, the, the, the next sort of step in this, you have the player doing it once. He's telling his own stories. Um, but then we allow them to also modify their game now. Okay? And just yesterday, we released uh, with our friends at Valve the Steam Workshop. Um, so now on Steam, on the PC, they can download our tools, they can create their own mods, and they just stream into the game. Something we spent a lot of time on that we're really excited about. Um, our PC audience um, really, really engaged. I mean, all the players of Skyrim are. Uh, but, you know, there are over 10 million people have played the game so far, which is amazing to us. Multiple millions of those on, are on the PC. We've done really well. Um, and with Steam, we get to see all the stats. Of those millions of people on the PC, the average playtime is 75 hours. That's what I said. Uh, pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, it's something we'd like to see come to consoles um, one day. But you get this thing where it's not just the game doing its thing, but now they can take it and change it and make it their own. Uh, we just did this with Valve. Show. I'll teach it. Teach it so now we're messing with our game with Valve, which is a lot of fun. Um, that's one of the mods you can download. Really fun. Um, so gaming. It's the ultimate combination of art, technology, and then allowing the players, the you know, person receiving that, to be their own director, to change it around. Um, but I think there is still something more to gaming. It's something that gaming can make you feel that no other form of entertainment can feel. Like, what is that actual, what is fun? Like, what is that nugget of fun? In most entertainment can give you lots of emotions, but what is the emotion that games can give you that nothing else can? And it's pride. Pride in what you did. This is me 10 years ago. This is a real, this is 10 years ago. I have just won the national championship in NCAA football on my PS2. It's one of my favorite games. So this picture is, is uh, I love it, I play it every year, and I win the national championship, and I am the man, once a year. Uh, it's the same as the same emotion as this, right? Very real emotion, um, same picture. I am not wearing a hat, but other than that, it's pretty much the same picture. Um, and you can design for this. How people feel when they have accomplished something themselves in your game is this feeling of pride that nothing else in entertainment can give you. And you can design for this moment, even simple things, puzzle games. My favorite sort of ego-stroking design to make you feel great moment in any game is Peggle. Have you, everybody here played Peggle? Have you finished a level? If you haven't, all levels end this way. I'm pretty great. I think I'll play another level. <laughs> I feel good right now. How do you all you feel good? Uh, here's another great one, just with sound. I haven't heard that as much as other people, but it is the modern warfare level up sound. To feel good, I attach it to Outlook when I send mail. <laughs> That's right, I replied. Um, you could take a lot of these things and take something like the old Robotron. Can you take something like that? Can you give it good story context? Can you give it a sense of pride when you accomplish? You can. You can do this with anything. Take care of my kids. You got nothing to worry about. go. It's putting the player in that sweet spot. Get those things right. You put the player in that sweet spot with that pride and the way they feel about your game and what they're doing, it makes it the greatest. When you're making your own game, this also goes to development, right? Um, 
you want to put yourself in that spot. You can see, you know, dev teams maybe who, who struggle. They're getting frustrated. They've challenged, they're doing something that's not working. They're getting frustrated. Their game isn't coming out. It comes out not what they wanted. Or you've played games where you can tell these guys were bored. Right? They just mailed it in. Finding that sweet spot when you're making your game and pushing yourself, that feeling of pride is, is also real. Um, because we've been given a, a great opportunity in making these games. And I, I think looking back at the industry over the last year, you know, one of the big things I think, um, and I want to salute the folks in the, the, folks in the ESA here, as, um, you know, the Supreme Court ruling on what games are. You know, the first, uh, it's been 60 years since movies got that protection. Now video games have that protection from the Supreme Court. You know, our game's art. My favorite thing written on this, uh, New York Times, Seth Chazelle, wrote this article. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It says this. It's now law that video games are art. And the courts rule that it's up to us, up to the people in this room, to show the world what art we can produce. Can we put ourselves in that sweet spot? Can we put the players in that sweet spot? Like Martin said, this is the golden age of gaming. Everything is successful. Every platform, every price point. It's on Facebook. Handhelds, it's everywhere. Someone makes a killer app from a nav system in my car, I will play it. It'll probably be successful. Success is everywhere. I'm known for saying install base doesn't matter. If it did, we'd all make board games because there are a lot of tables. <laughs> There's something very special about what we do. Again, do something great and you will find success. Make the player proud when he's playing your game. Make yourself proud that you made it. Make your player proud that he bought it. And let's all realize where we're at now with this industry and take advantage of the opportunity we have in creating what I feel is the world's greatest form of entertainment, video games. Thank you. <laughs>